All right, everybody, the time has finally come for the long-awaited return of the HPLC lecture series, and today we are going to be discussing the details for reverse phase HPLC. Remember to head on over to chemcomplete.com for guides. Details will be in the description below, and individual tutoring and consulting is available over there aside from guides. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So thank you for joining me for the third lecture in the HPLC series. If you have not checked out the first two lectures, I encourage you to do so, and links will be in the description below. Or you can check out the HPLC playlist, and it should be ranked just above this video here. And those videos are important if you want to understand some more about column chemistry, um, the different types of columns, end capping, pore size, all those different types of techniques relating to column and how column chemistry is important, how pH affects columns. That's all in the first two lectures. Uh, so check that out as the general background and layout. So from the third lecture forward here, we are going to be discussing more specific targeted information for HPLC. So this will be reverse phase, and then we may have a lecture on uh, ion exchange. We'll have a lecture on how pH can affect uh, functional groups, especially when we're talking about amino acids. So we're going to get into very specified topics, Okay, whereas the first two were more general topics. So today we are going to discuss the reverse phase HPLC, which is arguably going to be one of the most popular, if not the most popular HPLC method that is out there. So anytime that you hear people sitting and discussing common HPLC conditions, for instance, a C18 column or aqueous and organic mobile phases, they're almost always referring to reverse phase HPLC when they're discussing that. It is very common for research and development, and it can capture a pretty broad spectrum of compounds as far as retention time and what it can deliver. So where does the term reverse phase come from? Because this had to stem from somewhere if we have regular HPLC, and that's actually a hint right there. So when HPLC was originally being designed and studied, as well as developed, the first methods that were used involved a polar column and a rel relatively nonpolar mobile phase or liquid that was being pushed through. So after the original setup, the polarity of the phases were switched for experimentation purposes, and with those conditions, we ended up with the term reverse phase because they're reversing the conditions there. So a reverse phase HPLC setup is going to be one where the column or the stationary phase is going to be nonpolar in nature. So another word that we would use for that is hydrophobic in nature. And then the mobile phase, which is the solvent system that you're going to move through in order to push material through the column, is going to be polar. And we can see that because uh, when you start research and development here, it's very common to start with water, which is about one of the most polar liquids you can find, and then usually water with a combination of some sort of polar organic solvent uh, will be sort of a gradient technique. So as you continue to move through, you can play around or tinker with the amount of organic material that gets presented. For instance, methanol, acetonitrile, uh, THF, all of those are good options, and they start to slightly decrease the polarity in the mix because water is the most polar of the bunch, then it would be methanol, and we'll take a look at that as we get to that point. Okay, so to reiterate, in reverse phase chromatography, the mobile phase is going to be polar, Usually it'll be a mix of water and some sort of polar organic solvent, and the stationary column phase is going to be nonpolar. So usually when we talk about a nonpolar column, and again, go back and check the column chemistry lecture for the HPLC series, which is the one that came before this, all right? But usually when you're using a long-based carbon chain modifier on a silica column, that will be nonpolar. So one of the most common ones that we talk about for the column here is going to be something... 
along the lines of a C18. And when we talk about C18, we're talking about that you have the normal uh, silica bed conditions, and then they are going to be modified with these long carbon chains coming off. And these, not that I've drawn that exactly to scale there, but they're going to be 18 carbons long. And if you talk about these long chained hydrocarbons, that's going to be extremely nonpolar uh, as far as the stationary phase is concerned for those columns. All right, so you can start with a C18 and then you can play around with it if you want to try to use some different ones. Maybe that's a little too hydrophobic for what you're trying to separate. Okay, so our first goal is to understand what these conditions mean for the separation when we actually start putting material in there. When we have a mixture of components that are going to be subjected to reverse phase, we can expect that the hydrophilic or the polar compounds are going to have a very low retention time. All right, so if we have something that is hydrophilic, that means it's something that is going to be very easily or readily dissolved in water and a hydrophilic compound is going to in reverse phase conditions is going to equate to a low retention time so remember retention time is how long the column is retaining the actual compound so if it's a low retention time that means it will come off the column fast the column is not going to hold on to it very long you'll see it showing up in the early stages of the uh, printout and then, of course, we have on the flip side here the hydrophobic. So if we're going to deal with hydrophobic material that is in the mixture, this is going to interact with the column to a much larger extent. So those C18 chains, or maybe it's a C8 or whatever type of hydrophobic reverse phase setup you have, the hydrophobic material in your solutions that you're trying to separate, they will adhere to the column better. They're going to have better van der Waals interactions, dispersion forces. They are going to basically be more miscible or meld well with the stationary phase, and it's going to take a lot more to push them off all the way to the detector. And so that would mean that they will have a high retention time. And so we would expect that these are going to be very slow in comparison. Okay, and this is all a sliding scale. So certain hydrophilic to hydrophobic, right? You're going to have certain items that come off very fast and then some that will be in the middle. And then you'll have some that could be very slow. And that tends to be why we have to change the mobile phase over time in order to help assist some of these uh, materials that might have uh, the higher retention times and sort of kick them off of the column when it's time or move them along slowly enough. Okay, so that takes care of understanding how the column is going to hold on to hydrophilic versus hydrophobic materials and how long they're going to stay on until they are washed off to the detector. So knowing the general separation patterns, now that we have an understanding of that, what types of mixtures is a reverse phase going to be suitable for? Considering that we could have hydrophobic and hydrophilic in there, that seems like a large mix, uh, there are some limitations, but reverse phase, as I mentioned earlier, is pretty uh, versatile. We can use it for a lot. So it tends to be used whenever we have mixes that are going to contain materials that are less or under 2,000 Daltons. Now, when we use the term Dalton, for the sake of this lecture and understanding this, okay, you can equate a Dalton to a gram per mole, essentially. So uh, a Dalton, by definition, is going to be one twelfth of the carbon-12 atom, as far as mass is concerned. Okay, But for general purposes and for making it easy to understand, because we usually talk in molar mass, uh, if you have compounds that are under 2,000 grams per mole, then it would be acceptable to be use reverse phase conditions. Now, that being said, 2,000 grams per mole is pretty generous, so you're going to be able to find most, certainly all small and most medium-sized compounds are going to be able to be handled by reverse phase uh, chromatography. You may start to struggle if you get into some very complex proteins, um, some higher, more complicated structures in the biochemical realm. Uh, there might be better options suited for uh, characterizing and separation at that point. But if you have anything that is under 2,000 Daltons or, again, 2,000 grams per mole, that tends to be uh, pretty acceptable. Okay, so one of the things that will work well here is acids 
and bases. You can separate acids and bases well uh, on a reverse phase column. Now, keep in mind, in the previous lectures, we talked about the effect of pH on columns. So you need to still remember that when we're dealing with acid and base solutions, something that is extremely acidic or extremely basic could be detrimental to the columns, especially the silica-based columns. So you just need to keep that in mind. Um, and there are some other things that go along with this when we're talking about acids and bases. Usually you will end up using a buffer for your mobile phase. Okay. And when we start looking at some of this, it will get into a bit of the ion exchange. Okay, so we'll talk about ion chromatography. Now, ion chromatography is kind of a subset of the reverse phase, but it's detailed enough that it's going to warrant its own lecture at a later date. Uh, this is just a general reverse phase that we're going to talk about here. Okay, so speaking of which, if you have smaller and again, by definition, we're really talking about 2,000 grams per mole. But smaller proteins and peptides are acceptable for separation using a reverse phase. And with some of these, if we're talking about uh, amino acids, we obviously have to consider, and again, this will be a separate lecture, but the pH can affect the side chains and the forms in which some of those uh protonatable or deprotonatable side chains exist and that can change their retention time because certainly when you're in an ionic form you'll be uh, far more polar and that's going to inter uh, that's going to change how the compound will interact with the column at that point okay so those are some of the things that reverse phase is suited for okay so this is uh, we'll say ideal for reverse phase now just like there's things that are ideal for reverse phase, there are also going to be things that are non-ideal. That's why we have other forms of HPLC. And the things that would be considered non-ideal for reverse phase is going to be anytime you have a mixture of compounds that are very, or you can use the word extreme here, okay, hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Okay. And the reason for that is the opposite extremes of what we talked about at the beginning. So when you start talking about using reverse phase, anything that is excessively hydrophobic is going to stick to the stationary phase almost like super glue, and it's not going to be released to the detector very well. Uh, so you can have trouble when you get into very, very hydrophobic compounds. They stick to the columns and they can't get washed out very easily. And then if you get very, very hydrophilic columns, you have or very, very hydrophilic material, you have the opposite effect with the columns where you can't even adhere it to the columns. So it essentially gets washed out in the first pass effect, and it just basically all gets bundled up at the front of the detector without any sort of separation. And that's not good for us either. We're looking for a nice clean separation that's got some uh, good clarity as far as the peaks are concerned with resolution and how easily they're separated there. Okay, one of the other things, and this should be a concept that is familiar to organic chemists, is that you're going to have some issues if you're trying to separate stereoisomers. Okay, so stereoisomers when we start talking about them, many times they share almost identical uh, physical and chemical properties. It's only the rotation of light that can change them. So when we're talking about stereoisomers, for instance, we could talk about enantiomers, okay, or diastereomers, um, and those are very difficult to separate with reverse phase HPLC. They tend to cluster together and they are not going to separate very well. Okay, and then the final thing that's probably not ideal for reverse phase is, and you can tie this back into the first point, but inorganic ions. Okay, so inorganic ions are obviously being inorganic, they're not going to have carbon. And if you don't have carbon, you can't have hydrocarbon based material. And hydrocarbon based tends to help balance out with some of the uh, hydrophobic nature. So inorganic ions, by their very nature, uh, because they are ions, they tend to be extremely 
polar. And because of that, you can see the first point up there with things that are extremely hydrophilic. Uh, they're not going to be very well in uh, very well separated by the reverse phase techniques there. All right. So one of the techniques that we can utilize in HPLC optimization is the ranking of hydrophobicity. And this is very important. So uh, we sort of have a general idea now because we've made a list of what is reverse phase suited for and what is it not suited for. So when we pick out a mixture that reverse phase would be suitable for, how could we maybe have some predictive power or have a general understanding of what we would expect to come off of the column first and then last? Now, you can do that by just having a general sense of if something is hydrophobic or hydrophilic, okay? But uh, there's better ways that you can actually quantify this if you want to. So you have to keep in mind that just visualizing something is sort of a qualitative method when you're trying to do that. Okay, so we know that hydrophobic molecules will have longer retention times in the reverse phase conditions. So the ability to rank compounds by their hydrophobic characteristics is going to prove useful in predicting the general order of retention times. Right. So for example, we would expect small chained ethers to have a much higher retention time compared to a carboxylic acid of a smaller size. Right. So if I consider an ether, an ether is relatively nonpolar compared to a carboxylic acid. So let's just take a small ether here. So we've got uh, the dimethyl ether, right? And then if we have acetic acid, you can see the carboxylic acid acidity component is extremely polar compared to what we have with the ether. And so just a general small molecule to small molecule comparison here, if you understand your functional groups, you can determine that this should have a relatively high retention time. It's going to be nonpolar compared to this, which would have a low retention time. I would expect that to come off the column much quicker uh, if we have reverse phase conditions set up. Okay. Now, how can we quantify this? Because we're still looking at material qualitatively and sort of making guesswork of it based on that, which is fine. So while general comparisons are useful, the hydrophobicity of a molecule can be calculated and quantified using what's known as the log P scale. Okay, so this is log referring to logarithmic and P. Okay, so log P is going to be the base 10 log of the ratio of solute in octanol to solute in water. So the way that we can write that is the log of the concentration of the solute that is found in octanol, which is relatively nonpolar, over the solute that is found in water. Okay? And that is, again, known as log P. So a log P value is going to be a value that is basically looking at a ratio of how soluble is something in a hydrophobic liquid compared to a hydrophilic liquid with the hydrophilic being water. Okay, now this calculation is known as a partition coefficient, which examines the solubility of a compound in different solutions. So this is a generalized type of equation, but right here we're making it specific to the octanol and the water. Uh, in order to give it sort of a hydrophobic ranking. But anytime you want to look at extractions, like in a separatory funnel, you can use partition coefficients in order to see uh, what will optimally pull something out of one solution compared to another. Okay, So if a compound is mostly dissolved in the octanol, that's going to mean the numerator of this term is going to be extremely large, and the log P should be greater than zero. Okay, now if the compound is equally soluble in both liquids, then log P will be equal to zero because that means that you'll have the log of one and the log of one is equal to zero. And then finally, if the compound is water soluble more than it is uh, hydrophobic or soluble in the octanol, then that number is going to shrink rapidly and the log P is going to become a negative value. Okay, so if we have a log p value for a compound that is going to be greater than one it usually means that we're dealing with 
a hydrophobic material. Okay. And if we have something that is a log P is equal to zero, then that means that it's sort of right in the middle. Okay. And then if the log P ends up with a negative value, we'll just use negative one here as a placeholder. Okay. We're going to say that this then is starting to become hydrophilic in nature. All right, so this is useful because what I could do is I could take a bunch of compounds. Uh, now, I would need to have them isolated, but I could take a bunch of compounds and I could take a mixture of octanol and water in a separatory funnel and mix it up and see how much of that compound ends up in the octanol, how much ends up in the water. And uh, if you wanted to do this, uh, experimentally speaking, you could essentially turn around and uh, set up a laboratory extraction and then you'd need to go through some rotovapping trials where you remove the liquid and then see how much of it ended up in each solution. Okay. Now, if it's a common compound, you might be able to reference this in some sort of a handbook, um, like the CRC handbook. But if you needed to, you could also do it experimentally provided you could get a hold of the individual compounds uh, to judge that. So that is the log P scale in relation to uh, reverse phase and making predictions on how something would proceed forward. So obviously, uh, the, the more negative the log P, the quicker it's going to come out in terms of retention time. And then the larger the log P, the longer the retention time will be. It. It's going to hold on to it a lot longer. Okay, so what are some good general guidelines when we start talking about predicting retention time in reverse phase HPLC? Well, for one thing, as the amount of hydrocarbon content increases for a molecule, we're going to expect the retention time for that molecule to increase. And that only makes sense because hydrocarbons are going to correlate to hydrophobicity or being hydrophobic and that means that they would adhere to the column longer and when they're interacting with that stationary phase for a longer period of time they're not going to hit the detector for a longer period of time meaning their retention time on the column is going to be increased right so if we were to take something like methanol and compare it to octanol and we were able to detect that we would expect that octanol is going to stay on a column far longer than methanol as far as the adherence would be concerned okay for retention time so we can also say along the same general premise that if something has relatively low water miscibility and another word for that would be solubility okay so if something is low in water solubility then we're going to expect it'll have a high retention time because again things that are not very soluble in water are going to be hydrophobic by nature hydrophobic means they're going to interact well with the c18 column have a higher retention time right now something else that you should look for is when we start talking about branched chains okay so as far as organic compounds are concerned, when you have a branch chained molecule compared to a normal chain molecule, the branch chain molecule is going to have a lower retention time, okay? And the normal chain is going to have a higher retention time. And this can be traced back to, you look at the surface area as far as the amount of hydrocarbon material exposed over some amount of area, then you are going to have these branch condensed chains don't have as much. They can't interact with the column nearly as well, and they get pushed out a little bit quicker. They have pretty low retention times. So you expect to see them on the closer end as far as minutes of retention time. Okay, and then the last one that we should probably consider here is unsaturated compounds. So when we use this term, if you ended up taking my unknown spectroscopy course on YouTube, which is free here, you're welcome to hop over to that playlist and check it out. We discuss unsaturation and degrees of unsaturation very often. Okay, uh, but to be unsaturated means that you 
do not have full saturation of hydrocarbon, or in other words, you have rings or double bonds, and it could be triple bonds, but rings will put or pi bonds, okay, meaning double or triple bonds present. Okay, and if this is present, you're going to expect the retention time to go down because that's whenever you have a degree of unsaturation, you are removing a little bit of hydrocarbon material from a compound, which means that that compound compared to its saturated analog is going to move through a little bit quicker. It's not going to adhere to the column or the stationary phase quite as well. All right. Now, this has been, we've mostly been talking so far about the column, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and the materials that were passing through the column. But we haven't really discussed a whole lot about the mobile phase other than what we initially said at the beginning, which was that, uh, you know, when a lot of times people are talking about water and uh, organic mobile phases, they're talking about reverse phase HPLC. So when we start talking about the mobile phase for HPLC, uh, reverse phase HPLC, water tends to be the go-to for starters. So you're going to start with just regular water, okay? Now this is going to be relatively weak for the elution process, okay? And then you can bump it up from there. And the reason we say that this is weak elution is water is extremely polar, and again, when you're talking about a reverse phase column, a C18 column, for instance, you're going to have a lot of hydrophobic material adhering to it. And water is not going to be able to solubilize that material very well and sort of push it along the number of theoretical plates that it has to get through in order to actually be alluded to the detector. So it's going to repel those hydrophobic molecules. They're going to cling to the stationary phase quite uh, rapidly and they're not going to let go. Okay, so there's a general uh, sort of alignment that most technicians when they're doing reverse phase HPLC will utilize. And that is water is going to be your weakest as far as elution. Then your next step is going to be methanol. And again, this is on a sliding scale and it doesn't mean that if water's not working, you go to pure methanol. It might be that you do 50% water and 50% methanol and see what happens there. It might be that you do uh 33 percent water and 66 percent methanol see how that works okay so you have to keep in mind when we're talking about a lot of this this is research and development so if you're trying to separate something and you're not seeing uh good separation you need to usually start adjusting the mobile phase that's one of the first things you want to check uh provided you're you're actually running a compatible setup meaning uh you know i have all compounds that are under 2000 Daltons, and so reverse phase is acceptable given the material I have because it's generally running a, a mild range between hydrophobic and hydrophilic, right? So if you know that you actually have a decent setup, uh, the first one of the first things and one of the easier things and more affordable things to change is your solvent, right? Because changing columns out and swapping them all the time, that can get very costly. Um, you usually want to use a C18 column when you start and then you can play around with your different solvents. So you've got water, then methanol, okay, then we're going to use acetonitrile, and then we would rely on THF. Now THF, tetrahydrofuran, is going to be a cyclical uh, hydrocarbon ether, okay, so again, as far as non-polarity is concerned, uh, and this right here, right, would just be the cyano group. As far as hydrophobicity is concerned, this would be the champion of the four of them here. So this would push things along fairly readily with THF. Okay, so the way that you can view this, right, we come along here, you can say that this would be considered, uh, we can call it elution power. Okay, so how well does something elute material off of the C18 column? Um, and then going this way, right, we could call this polarity. Right, so water is extremely polar. THF is relatively nonpolar compared to water.
And then water has very weak elution power, right, which we set at the beginning up there under the mobile phase. And then we increase the power as we go along in this uh, order of solvents here. So you can certainly pick other solvents. You don't have to stick to these four, although they are arguably the most common uh, of the bunch that tend to be used in reverse phase. But you can utilize other solvents provided the following. So a solvent that you're going to pick out to use in your mobile phase should be water miscible. Okay, and that's because you want to be able to mix it and create some level of uh, like a gradient or at least a ratio mixture uh, when you're talking about that. So water miscibility is going to be extremely important. All right, one of the other things you need to uh, consider is your detector. And a lot of people are using UV detection here. So you want low UV detection because it obviously would not be ideal to be picking out a solvent that is going to be constantly hitting the detector and interfering with picking up other compounds that you have interest in. Okay, it's usually a good idea to make sure that you have a solvent that has a low viscosity. Okay, so viscosity is referring to the thickness, how well it flows, and you want low viscosity because something that's high viscosity or basically flows very slow, almost like a syrup, you're going to end up with pressure issues. And you need to be careful of that. So if you go back to the original lectures that we had, okay, you one of the things you need to be very careful about is building up pressure. That's why we have those pumps there and we're continuously trying to move, but having lots of pressure build up can become problematic when you're trying to run the HPLC and that can damage the instrument at certain points. Okay, so the last thing, this is a, a general premise for all solvents, not just HPLC, uh, but you want a solvent that's going to be non-reactive, right? So when I say it's universal, uh, we're also talking about reactions. If you run a reaction, an organic chemistry reaction in a solvent, the solvent needs to be non-reactive unless it's supposed to be doubling up as a reagent for your actual reaction. You know, an example like solvolysis or something of that nature. But in general, you want non-reactive solvents uh, that just sort of act as uh, carriers for this material. They're not going to be reacting with it whatsoever. Okay? Now, again, mobile phases will often be water and then they become water with organic material as you start to sort of tinker around with the perfect development when you're doing research and development and you're optimizing the conditions, okay? Now, one of the things that's important with your solvents is you want to be able to change your solvents readily enough uh, when they are sort of made because you could buy these big liters of solvent, right? Four liter bottles, whatever you might have, big gallon drums, uh, like 55 gallon drums or whatever. Um, but you need to realize that certain, certain mobile phases have certain shelf lives. And a lot of it has to do with uh, whether organisms are going to be able to readily grow in those environments. So water um, is going to be the least of the bunch here. And you can also say that this is true for buffers because most buffers are going to be aqueous. Occasionally buffers can last a little bit longer than this because of the salt content. But in general, uh, any water based needs to be changed every 48 to 72 hours. Okay, so this includes if you're going to be running an HPLC, right? Let's say that you load up your HPLC and you've got it over the weekend uh, and you're using water. That's fine, 48 to 72 hours. You could leave it on a Friday, come back on a Monday. But let's say that you uh, have some sort of HPLC with a backup sampling tray and you load it up and you want it to be running off of the same solvent bottle for uh, two weeks while you take vacation, that could be problematic. Uh, let's say that you've got an HPLC and you don't really properly flush the lines or the column out and it sort of just sits there for a long time because you don't have any samples to run. That water that's sitting in there, that is not ideal. You don't want to let that sit around for more than 48 to 72 hours. You want to refresh it each time um, in order to avoid this sort of stuff. Okay, So 48 to 72 hours is the shelf life for most water and buffer solutions when you're doing reverse HPLC.
Okay. Now, if you have a mixture and the mixture is less than 20% organic material, okay, so meaning the bulk of it is water, this is appropriate for up to one month. Okay, so you need to have 20% or less, but you should have some organic material in there. So some methanol, some acetonitrile. Okay, so think about when we get ready to sterilize things, uh, right? People using hand sanitizer, stuff like that. The alcohol is what's actually coming along and doing the killing of this bacteria or whatever it might be. So organisms don't thrive particularly well in most organic solvent conditions. And certainly the higher the concentrations go, uh, the more applicable that is. So a mix, an aqueous mix, that's going to be less than 20% organic material, you can usually, give or take, get around a month out of that shelf life before you have to make it up again. Okay, now, if you have a mix that is going to be greater than 20%, and this is what's usually suggested if you're going to have long-term uh, sort of HPLC idling or whatnot, okay, that is you could have potentially up to three months because the higher organic content is really going to prevent uh, any sort of issues there. And then what if you're just doing straight organics? So meaning you're using pure methanol um, or something of that nature. Generally to be safe, three months, you could probably push it up to five or six months, but three months is just, HPLCs are expensive pieces of equipment. You want to make sure you're maintaining it. You would like good results. Usually every three months, if you've got a methanol or an acetonitrile, that will be appropriate to change once every three months. Now, again, this can depend on how quickly you're pushing out samples. So a lab that is constantly doing analysis, like an analytical lab that receives a large number of samples each day and needs to separate them, you probably wouldn't even get close to a three month out of a four liter bottle because you're running it constantly. So you might need to be replacing that every couple days, every week, every two weeks. Um, the water content and the buffers tend to be more important there, that you're making up fresh water and buffers every two to three days uh, when you're involved with that, okay? Now, another note here uh, for the mobile phases. It is very important you always, and I'm going to stress this, you always want to be using HPLC grade solvents. So if you go into a Thermo Fisher or, uh, you know, a Sigma Aldrich or wherever you're ordering your chemicals from, you can buy cheaper and it will be far more affordable uh, solvent when they don't purify it to the degree that is usually required for HPLC grade. So when you get to HPLC grade solvents, you're certainly above most of the time 99% purity with that. And um, you, it is very important because when you are pushing this through, even the smallest amount, it could affect the retention time and the results. And it's also introducing material that you don't necessarily want to be pushing through your very expensive columns. Okay, So you need to make sure that you are always attempting to use HPLC grade. Now, I'm starting to run out of room on my whiteboard here, so let me clear some of this and I will be right back. Okay, so what if the desired resolution is not obtained, right? You pick out uh, what you think might be a good solvent mixture here, and you get poor separation. A lot of the peaks are clustering together. It doesn't look like what you want. So what do you have? Well, logically, without running off and again changing methods or columns or something like that, you really... Uh, can look at two things, which is number one, if you're having trouble with this, you can change the ratio that you're working with. Okay, now this is assuming you're already working with a ratio, so meaning you're not just working with pure water or something like that, but you can change the ratio of the organic to aqueous or water uh, mixture. Okay, and play around with that. So if you're seeing that everything's coming off too soon, then that means that you probably have a little bit uh, too much as far as the uh, hydrophobic portion is concerned, right? So it could mean multiple things. It could also mean that the mixture that you're trying to separate has too many 
uh, hydrophilic components and they're all just pouring off immediately. But if you really do have a nice range and then they're all sort of just coming off, it could mean that you ended up using a little bit too much organic material because it's sort of washing off the hydrophobic material a little bit too early and it's all coming to the detector and clustering in one area. So maybe you need to back off and add a little more water, okay? Now if you have the opposite problem and you're trying to set up a reasonable timed run, let's say you want to separate a couple compounds over the course of 15 minutes based on the number of samples you have to get through in a day, and you're sitting there, you're sitting there, you're waiting 45 minutes, you're still waiting for material to come off, well then maybe at that point you need to consider adding a little bit more of the organic material to start moving this along in a reasonable pace. So it's a very fine dance between how much organic and how much aqueous in order to optimize those conditions. Okay. Now the second thing that you can do um, if the ratios just really don't seem to be working is to change or add a new solvent. Okay. So I would always suggest playing with the ratios first that you're working with. Um, usually you're probably going to be basing your research and development off of previous literature. Maybe you're not. Um, so there might be a starting point or some good idea and then you can tinker around with it a little bit based on your needs. But you could always change to a new solvent. So let's say that uh, you're really not seeing the results that you need for the water methanol mixture. So head on over to a water and uh, acetonitrile mixture or head over to a water and THF mixture. Now, it is also possible because I said change or add, you can start making ratios of three. So maybe it becomes that you want 20% methanol, 30% acetonitrile, and 50% water. Again, that's arbitrary. You would test that out and see how the separation looks. If it looks horrific, then you can change it around based on whether it's coming out too soon or it's not coming out at all. It's coming out too late. Okay, so those are the two major things. And just keeping in mind from everything that we've talked about um, and sort of referencing back to that uh, that chart that we made where we said, okay, here's water on this end, right, and the THF on the other end. If you're dealing with water, methanol, okay, uh, so either of these or a mix of the two, in general, you're going to be trying to promote longer and slower retention time, okay, so longer and slower spread, and maybe that's something that you want. Maybe right now you're currently working with acetonitrile and it's just, it's coming out too fast, and you'd like to see a longer and a slower spread then water and methanol might be what you want to go to. You might want to increase with some of those. Now, you could be having the opposite problem and say, this is taking forever. We need to get through it in a reasonable time. Then you might want to start tapping into the acetonitrile and the last resort being the THF because that will really push things along. Okay, And so this would be fast dilutions that would be expected, right? And this is going to have a relatively, what I would say, is a strong pace. So you're going to be pushing things off the column at a good clip. You need to make sure that it's not too good at pushing material off the column because again you could just end up sort of clustering everything in the first initial wash that comes off the column and then you're not really effectively separating stuff at all. Uh, and you do want good separation of those peaks right because one of the things down the road that we're going to talk about and that we would be interested in is looking at the area uh, in relation to those peaks because that can tell you how much of each individual component is in your mixture, right? So that becomes important if you've got uh, clients sending you samples and they're saying, I'd like to know the percent makeup of these five different amino acids in here. Well, in order to do that, you have to have clean separation of each peak. You can't have them all clustered together or shouldering off of one another because you're not going to get clear areas under the peak uh, that allow you to basically integrate that area and determine the relative ratios or percentages of each material uh, in the compound or the mixture. All right, so uh, just one last thing to wrap it up because we're headed to 45 minutes here. This is one of the longest lectures I've made, uh, but reverse phase has a lot of stuff. Okay, so uh, columns. Let's just talk about them very briefly here. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail because we already had an entire HPLC lecture dedicated to columns. Again, if you need to check out any of that stuff, link in the description is below. Um, so for the column, the stationary phases, it is almost 
industry standard, you start with a C18 when you're doing the reverse phase. It's the most common as far as being hydrophobic, and it's very good for researching, uh, doing research and development. You can end up switching around the solvents however you'd like. Uh, if a C18 just really isn't working for you, then the general uh, flow tends to be C8 followed by a C4. Okay, if those still are not working, you can look at sort of a cyano-based column. So these are derivatives that have uh, CN groups that are coming off. Okay, after that, and now this is really starting to get into um, some higher levels of polarity, but you could have a phenyl base column. So phenyls generally are considered hydrophobic, but compared to an 18-membered hydrocarbon chain, they would be considered fairly uh, polar, uh, right, in comparison to that. Um, we've got multiple degrees of unsaturation occurring there. And then finally, uh, the last stop could be that you could potentially consider some sort of an amino column, right? So that's going to be uh, sort of some sort of N group that could either have like an R, uh, or NH. If it's all NH, then you're talking about a fairly polar column. At that point, we're starting to talk about just regular phase HPLC and not reverse phase anymore. So sliding scale here. Um, and when we take a look at this, okay, we've got, you come and you look at this, and we've got decreasing hydrophobicity, okay? So when we talk about that, it means that it's getting more and more polar at the bottom. Um, so the most hydrophobic would be the C18 that we see at the top there. And then if we wanted to draw something going the other way, that should be a B there. Oh my goodness, I'm messing up, excuse me, messing up with the pen there. Okay, so if we come up this way, then again, we could say something like increasing polarity. I'm sorry, no, not the increasing polarities down here. Uh, this would be increasing retention time. Retention time. You can tell I've been talking too long. It's 45 minutes here. Okay, so that is going to conclude reverse phase. I think we will leave it there. That's quite a bit of information to take in for this. So I haven't exactly decided what I'm going to do for the next HPLC lecture. I will try to put it out in the next couple of weeks. Um, I might do a course on going into more detail about pH because pH is very important. So we've already discussed pH with the columns, but talking about pH um, for different compounds that are being passed through, like, again, amino acids and how that could affect the side chains. Um, I might do ion exchange next or start looking at ion chromatography. So we'll figure it out. Um, but this concludes the reverse phase. Um, as always, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. If you subscribe and hit the little bell, you'll be up to date anytime we are releasing new content, particularly the big lectures like this. I know this. Uh, there have been a lot of requests. I'm sorry this took so long. There's been some shifting around of various things going on in life, but here you go. Reverse phase HPLC lecture three. Lecture four will be in the works shortly. Thank you for all the support. As always, head on over to chemcomplete.com. Down in the description, you can show us support over there anytime. Thank you very much for learning with us, and I will see everybody for the next lecture.